So in order to be a channeler, you have to be, a, what is the word? Is it channeler? Chandler. Channeler? Back to the channel, everyone. It's your resident internet psychic medium, and spiritual advisor, Mystic Rain, and today we're going to be talking about channeling. So, uh, a question was submitted. You know, I love those, and this one is about channeling. Um, it, it says, "If there was one thing I want to learn more from you, it'd be about channeling the different types of channeling, the hows and the whys of it. I get channel messages too, but sometimes I still have difficulty differentiating." them for my own feelings, thoughts, opinion, observations, because I've always been someone open to many perspectives than being understanding to them. I tried to look into this by studying it with other spiritual advisors too, and of course they help, but I'm very interested in what you will channel and teach. So I did channel something and I will teach this to the best of my ability. So interestingly enough, I actually had to channel how to teach channeling. I sat at my kitchen table, for those of that you don't know, uh, I get a lot of downloads there and Spirit is always talking to me there. I guess probably because I'm most relaxed. It could be the food thing. I don't know. And um, so I sat there with a pencil and or a pen and a notebook and I said, I need your help. And they said, with what? And I was, And I said, I don't know how to explain this. And they actually walked me through the steps of how to explain it to you. And they actually told me the certain websites that I needed to go to in order to read, in order to be able to tell you how to do this. And then so, or explain it to you in terms of like how it works. The weirdest thing with channeling is that it's kind of something that people just do. And when it comes to the ex explanation of like how to do it, it just doesn't cross a lot of people's minds. So I'm going to do the best of my ability. But before we do that, I do have some channeled messages for you guys. It's not a lot, um, but you need to know. So first thing is I need all of you to check your bank account regularly for the next two weeks. Fraud is gonna be on the uptick. It's just gonna be dumb crazy. And some of you are gonna find that people have your credit card numbers, that they're siphoning out money little by little. So for the next two weeks, just make sure you're checking your bank account. I wouldn't say that you need to be scared or that you need to be worried or anything like that. If something happens with the account, obviously just tell the bank and get a new card or something like that. But I do sense that that's gonna be a thing. Um, funny enough, I don't necessarily sense that this is timeless. So I feel like if you post or if you watch this video close to the time I've posted it, that's actually the time that I'm talking about. So I would say if you make it to this video sometime within the next 30 days of postage, so read the date on when I posted it, that applies to you. If you get here after the fact, then I would say don't really worry about it. Um, someone is going to be dumb and play with a scorpion and then get bit. Uh... What I'm seeing in my mind's eye is someone looking at a scorpion going, oh, that's kind of cute, coochie, coochie, coo, and then getting pinched. I see little pinchers doing this, and you're not going to like it. It's not going to be fun. Um, someone likes making jewelry, particularly with using like blue stone, turquoise, or even halite that's dyed blue. People have complimented you on this. Um, you should turn that into a small business. I would highly suggest that you consider selling those things, okay? Um, and the last thing I have, because it wasn't a whole lot today, is that it's time to learn how to deal with conflict. There are some of you that like to cut people off when you argue. All right. It's time for us to outgrow that. Arguing and having a difference of opinion does not mean that there is an absence of love. You don't always have to agree in order to continue to love someone. And you don't have to cut people out of your life because you got into an argument. And for whoever that's for, you will know that I'm talking to you. Okay, so now, uh, channeling, what is it? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simplify the concept. We're going to boil it down until it cannot be boiled anymore. And then we're gonna come and expand it back out again, right? Because so if I start from the esoteric metaphysical side of it, it may not make sense. Like I know that you guys 
understand the concept of channeling, but in terms of the nitty gritty, in terms of specifically how it works, if I start here, it's not gonna make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna start here and then we're gonna go here. So a lot of you live near um, a body of water. Uh, if you live in like England, for example, you probably live next to a strait or a channel. Channels are considered straits because it is a straight line of water that is connecting two larger bodies of water. So typically what you'll see, it'll be like C, straight, C, right? Or C, channel, C, and they're joined together. Think about as well, like a radio or a TV, when you wanna listen to the radio, when you get into your car, what do you do? You change the channel. If you wanna watch TV and there's something particular that you wanna see, what do you do? You change the channel. And when you're changing a radio or a TV, TV more so like back in the day, not current day TV, but like there's static in between, right? That static in between hopping from radio station to radio station or TV station to TV station is a frequency. It's a particular frequency. And when you're searching for a certain sound or a certain song that you want to hear on a radio or a certain TV show that you want to watch on TV and you are surfing through the channels, what you are doing is trying to find a certain frequency. And once you find that frequency and you land on, land on it, what you are experiencing is a message that's being transmitted to you. If it's the radio, the message is, is audible, right? You're listening to it. You're hearing it. If it's on TV, you're, you're watching it, right? And so you actually are bouncing around, playing around between a band of frequencies. And you are searching that band of frequency to get what it is that you want to have, i.e. typically a message that's being transmitted to you, something that you want to hear in the form of a song or something that you want to watch in the form of television. The radio itself or the TV itself is just a conduit of um, transferring that frequency to you. But what you are really after is not the radio, it's not the TV, you're really after a certain frequency. Its job, i.e. radio and television, is just to transfer the frequency to you. But that's all that it's doing. The rest of what you're enjoying is the frequency itself. A human channel works the same way. It is someone that has the ability to access different bands of frequency in order to relay a message back. Or it is someone that acts as that strait of water or that channel of water that's in between two bodies of spirit and it's connecting spirit on both sides of the veil so spirit on our side of the veil spirit on the other side now what we typically hear about are mediums and mediums or mediumship is a form of channeling but not all mediums consider themselves to be channelers and the reason for that is because mediumship is actually a sub-discipline of channeling itself, which is interesting because that's specifically what Spirit wanted me to tell you. It's actually a subdiscipline. It's not all of what channeling is. And that is because, and that is why a lot of people that are mediums don't actually consider themselves to be channels or channelers. They just consider themselves to just be mediums because it's just a subdiscipline. They may not be able to do the rest of the subdisciplines. They may not be interested in the subdisciplines. They may have not thought about or practice the subdisciplines because a lot of times when people are mediums, they kind of fall into it. You can be trained in mediumship, but typically people have already had the ability or maybe they've always kind of been in tune to it. And so when it develops, it's not necessarily starting a skill from scratch. It's something that they've already had and then they just learn to hone. And But when it comes to understanding all of the disciplines of channeling, because people are, don't necessarily always practice it, they may not consider themselves to be an actual channel. They just may stick with the word medium and then move on. A medium's role is to primarily work with the dead, right? So the past loved ones, um, ancestors, and um, but they primarily are working with people that have passed over but have recently passed over by what we consider to have been recently passed over. And that in itself is actually... Um, 
It's a subdiscipline, but it's also like a specialty. To be able to work with that particular group of spirit is like a specialty. Think about like a therapist and how some therapists do better when they're working with people that are dealing with grief. Some par therapists do better with people that have anxiety. And it's like a specialty similar to mediumship and how mediums are typically dealing with past loved ones or ancestors or ancestors that have recently passed over. It's a specialty. In addition to that, there are some mediums too that can also work with uh, spirit guides as well. I would argue that that's probably a different subdiscipline and a different specialty, but while channeling, I actually couldn't figure out what the name of it was. Nothing was relayed to me and I actually, I mean, I don't know, but I would actually classify that differently than being in the subdiscipline of mediumship. Just don't really know what the name is. Um, there are other forms of channeling too that I'm aware of called trance, right? Trance is one form of a subdiscipline. Trance is when you are in a really deep, restful, meditative state. It allows your brain to access different waves and it goes into like a trance-like state. You are more open and um, sort of subjective when it comes to like receiving information. Um, you can study trance, you can train on trance, and some people are trance workers and they do their channeling in this way. Um, trance is interesting in the sense that I have met people along my journey who haven't been really comfortable with it because they don't necessarily like the idea of being so much in a deep state. For some reason, they equate that with being out of control and not wanting that. And so um, they don't like uh, consciously do that. But I think that people probably do it more often than they would think they do. Because when you go to sleep, that window between wakefulness and sleepiness, a lot of people get information during that time. In my opinion, that state that your body is in, that state that your mind is in, is a trance-like state. So you probably have done chance channeling at some point in time if you feel like you're like heavenly intuitive and probably just didn't know that you was doing it. One thing that people, though, don't realize is that um, you can channel from any form of intelligence. It's not just like an ancestor, right, or a past loved one. Um, it's literally any form of intelligence. So some people channel different gods and goddesses or the energies of different gods and goddesses. You can channel um, different galactic beings, right? Different planetary beings. Um, it's any form of actual intelligence. In addition to that, you can channel from the collective intelligence as well. So if you think of like a body of just collective information. It's not housed anywhere. No one was holding it. There's not a being that has that information. It's just a body of where all of our collective wisdom goes. You can channel from that. Some people call that the Akashic Records. That's also a huge reason as to why a lot of mediums don't consider themselves to be channelers because they don't access all of those different intelligence levels, right? A lot of um, mediums are not talking to different galactic beings. Um, they are not necessarily accessing the Kashuk records or pulling from, um, what's, what word did I use? Collective intelligence. They're not pulling necessarily from that. They may only specifically be working with past loved ones. And so because of that, they're not, they don't call themselves a channel because it is a subdiscipline and each discipline has to do with whatever intelligence that you're actually connecting to and, and pulling in information from. And so in order to be a channeler, you have to be, a, what is the word? Is it channeler? Chandler. Channeler? But in order to be one, you have to have an incredibly, incredibly open mind. And you have to work really hard to try to be as neutral as possible and not to be as judgmental as you can be. Because when you start accessing information, one, it's a lot of information, Two, you don't know the context of any of that information. And because it's so much and because you're just pulling in something from a certain frequency, you also don't necessarily always know what you're going to get. And so you have to be incredibly open to the information that is revealed to you because sometimes it can actually um, be the direct opposite of what you thought something was or the story that you've always held for yourself. In terms of specifically like how it works, how I would describe the action of what's happening when you are doing it on purpose, when you are, because 
there are people that it just comes to them naturally. They just get pieces of information. They're like, oh, where did that come from? And then there are people who can actually pull it out and draw from it. And so when you're doing it intentionally, what it's like is like being a spirit investigator. You are the investigator of all things esoteric, metaphysical, and spiritual. And when you go to channel information, you have to approach it as if you are a detective. The reason for that is because you're literally tapping into infinite information. If you don't know what you're looking for, how the hell are you supposed to find it? It's also similar to, I would say, maybe going into a library because you're looking for something. Maybe you have to write a research paper, so you go to your school's library. When you walk into that library, you're on the hunt for something specific. You don't just walk through the doors, look at all the rows of books, and think to yourself, I'm going to search through all these rows of books. You know exactly what you're looking for. You have an idea of subject, right? And then what do you do? Maybe you go to a computer, you type it in, it gives you a Dewey Decibel number, right? And then you start from there. And you go straightly to the row or rows that um, should have the topic that you're looking for. But it's very specific. You start honing in when it comes to some certain information that you're looking for. Channeling is the same thing. But instead of looking for like a book, you're looking for a particular frequency. Because as a channel, you have the ability to access different frequency bands. And so whatever information you're looking for, what you're really doing is tapping into that frequency. So you are deliberately turning the dial on the radio, trying to find something. But you're always looking for something. You're never going in there willy-nilly. You are on a mission to find something specific, and then you're on your way back. So how do you find that frequency? You find the frequency by first identifying the frequency you're looking for. Again, going back to the radio, if you have a favorite radio station, you know what frequency you're looking for. You know what station plays the genre of music that you want to hear. When you are watching TV, you may know what show you want to watch, and you may know what um, station that show is on, and so you're looking for something specific when you go to that TV. When you are channeling, it's exactly the same. You're looking for something specific. You're going to that specific frequency. And the way you go to that specific frequency is by first posing the investigative question. What is it that you're looking for? In order for me to make this video, my initial question was, how do I explain what channeling is? And then from there, that's huge. That's vast. That's not, that's giving me the frequency band but it's not giving me the frequency on the frequency band. Okay, so now I need to take that question and then I need to narrow it down again. Okay, let's start with layman terms. What specifically is channeling? Then you start to hone in on that frequency. The more you start to, to sort of boil it down, the closer and closer and closer you get to that frequency. And you have to boil it down as much as you can. You wanna to try to be as specific as possible because you have to think you are literally searching all of the universe, the multiverse, in order to find the answer to that question. So being vague may take you a long time. It's not that you won't get there, right? It may just take you a really long time in order to get there. That is why um, spirit can sometimes read as fickle when they're not necessarily being fickle. They are just wanting you to be specific, right? So anyone that does work with spirit, maybe you have a guide that you have the ability to kind of communicate with. And if you're not in like direct communication, maybe you can feel it or, you know, maybe it's like intuition where you, you may ask a question and then there's this feeling afterwards of like, what does that mean? Or be more specific or ask it again in a more concise way because you're literally asking a spirit to go find the answer to you or give you the answer, but they need to know what frequency that they're giving you. If I say, how do I create a video about channeling? The frequency band is massive. Okay, well, what does that mean? Specifically, what about channeling are you trying to create a video for? And that's going to require me to reduce the question down again in order to find that specific frequency band. And so like, that's kind of like the gist of it. It's actually not as exciting for me when I channeled it. It wasn't as exciting as I thought it was. It was actually very sort of like duh in your face. Like, oh yeah, like of course it would kind of work that way. You're just tuning into a frequent, a particular frequency and you simply do that by identifying it. What are you looking for? And then that's the frequency that you tune into. There is no, it's, it's really simple, genuinely as simple of as thinking about it. But um, a lot of people, like I said before, they just kind of fall into it. They didn't necessarily train in being a channel. 
a lot of people may train in psychic development, but being a channel specifically, not necessarily because it's a discipline. And then everything within it is a subdiscipline, like being a medium, for example. But even with being a medium, a lot of people have a tendency to fall into that too. I was one of those people that happened to fall into that, into those categories. And um, like my mediumship was completely accidental. And um, prior to me becoming a medium, I did not want to be one. I was never, I never thought that I was always mediumistic. I knew I always had like certain like psychic or intuitive abilities. However, it's, they scared me. And so I cut them off as hard as I could. I remember being a kid. And when I saw like my first ghost, I was like, that's it for me. I don't need to come back here. Enough is enough. I'm, we don't mm -mm, like, we don't need to do this. This is not the life I want to live. Right. And then eventually life kind of caught up with me. And was like, mm, this is kind of your calling. You need to sort of accept this. And like, here we are. But the way it happened for me was I actually, uh, 10 years ago, lost my sister. My sister was actually murdered. And because it was so traumatic and it was so quick, when it happened, she didn't cross over right away. She was also shocked. And it was the day she was murdered was the day I became a medium. And the reason for that is because she was shocked. One, she didn't know what was going on. And because it was sudden, she needed to sort out her final affairs and she needed help to do that. And so she pestered me until I accepted that I could hear, see, sense her and whatever. And so essentially what happened after she died, not too long afterwards, it couldn't have been more than two or three hours. I started to feel like someone was talking in my ear. And it felt like someone was really, really close to my ear, almost like how when people like tell you a secret that that air that you feel, that hot air, is kind of what my ear started to feel like. And I remember thinking that I was just grieving, like I was shocked. It's a crazy situation. You know, whatever I'm experiencing right now, of course, it's not normal. And I didn't kind of really look too much into it. And then another hour would pass and then I would hear my name shout it like someone shouting my name and I would turn around and nobody was there and again because I'm grieving I'm thinking okay I'm crazy this is normal this is what happens when things like that are really crazy but it was happening the whole day the following day because now of course we're all in a frenzy because she you know she just died she was just killed and it's a big to do you know you've got detectives it's all over the news in Atlanta and there's a police chase and it's a whole thing and so Everything was really loud. And I remember uh, everyone was occupied and it was a lot of chaos and the police were assholes. And I remember it just being an incredibly emotionally, it was a lot. It was a lot emotionally. It was a lot mentally. So when I started to experience these things, I just was writing it off as part of the experience. It wasn't that anything metaphysical was happening to me. And then, but it kept happening. And I would be in a hotel room because um, we didn't live in the same state. So I had to get to where she was. And but then being in the hotel room, I would feel a presence looking at me or I would be, you know, eating. And I would it almost felt like someone was looking over my shoulder like, hey, was she eating? And it just the presence just got so big and it got so loud where I was like, could it be one of those situations where the person hasn't passed because of how it happened? And so I remember like kind of like going, well, shit, things can't get any worse than what they already are. So, OK, I'll be open to what I think I'm feeling. And then I heard someone shout my name again. I turned around and I didn't see anyone there. And then I heard, bitch, <laughs> which I can laugh about now because that is how my sister would have called me if I was not paying attention to her. She would have been like, bitch, don't you hear me calling your name? Like, can't you hear me talking to you? And then that's what I heard, bitch. And I turned around and like, no, no one was there. And I remember like saying her name. Her name was Atima. I can say that now because it took me a long time to get to the point where I can finally say her name. But I was like, Tima? And then she was like, oh, finally. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> And then she says, do you know like how long I've been trying to get your attention? And she was talking to me exactly how she would spoken to me to, uh, since she was alive. And she was like, you are the only one that can hear me. 
I'm trying to get everyone's attention. No one can hear me, but you can hear me. And so she was pestering me because she knew I was picking up on it. And so she just kept just going at it, right? Until I became aware enough to talk to her. So after that happened, I was like, okay, well, what do you want? Like, what do you need me to do? Are you okay? And I remember like first going, oh my God, like, are you okay? Like knowing that like her body is not okay, but like her spirit, because when I initially had heard that things like that happen to people, I was like, they get stuck. They never pass on. Oh my God, what are we going to do? And I was like, are you okay? And she was like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. She was like, but girl, <laughs> man, I didn't expect that shit to happen. Right. She was so shocked. She was like, I did not see that coming. She was like, like, holy shit, what a ride. It's almost like she blinked and she popped out of her body. She did not see it being an issue at all. She didn't foresee her death at all. It was just as much of a shock to her as it was to everybody else. And she was like, oh shit. And so what she said to me, she was like, I need your help because obviously this is so fast. I need to like figure things out, organize things. There are certain things that I have that I want family members to have if they don't know where to find it. And also I need to comfort people because where people were at that time, everyone was, you know, when people pass away, people are in different states and there it takes time because people have to start flying in. And so people were in different states. And at that time, my mother, when she was alive, was also in a different state. And I'll never forget. My sister said, OK, um, hold down the fort here. Let everybody here know that I'm OK. I'm going to go back to Florida because that's where my mother lived at the time. And I'm going to go be with mommy. I'm going to go like calm her down, but make sure everyone over here is okay and tell everybody I'm okay. So I was like, okay. And then, so that's what I started to do. I started to tell everybody, Hey, she's okay. Her spirit is fine. I spoke to her spirit. Her spirit is fine. And people were at such a place of like profound grief that when I was saying I spoke to her, her spirit, her spirit is fine. At that moment, no one was actually questioning me because everyone wanted to hear something about her being okay. That it was like reassuring them that she was okay. Like I spoke to her, she's fine. And then I called my mom and I was like, hey mom, um, I just want you to know that she's fine. I spoke to her fear, her spirit, she said she was okay. My mom said, oh my God, that's so wild that you're saying this to me because literally a few seconds ago, I felt her presence with me. And I remember smiling to myself because she had literally told me that that's where she was going. And so I was like, oh, okay. And then she would tell me like where things were, like certain belongings, like, don't worry about that. Look over here. Like when we were trying to clean out her apartment, do this, do that. And so it was, I just, I had to help her. And then she, her spirit actually lingered down here for a while, for about four months. And she didn't linger because she was a lost spirit. It was because she had so many affairs and people were in so much grief because of how she died that she didn't want to leave everyone behind. She wanted them to know that she was okay. And so she was comforting everybody. And so through that experience, I learned that spirits sometimes will stay behind to comfort people. It does has nothing to do with them being a lost soul. And it does not mean that they're not intending to pass. They have every objective to go. They are just making sure that you are okay before they go. And sometimes what they do, they stay in order to help you go to sleep and then they go. And then when it's time for you to wake up, they may come back. That's why when people have loved ones that pass away in the beginning of that death period, when you're grieving, there's a period where you feel like you feel their presence often. And then as time goes on, they it's because they are leaving, you start to feel their presence less and less and less and less and less because they start checking on you less and less and less and less because they're like, okay, I can leave them now. They're okay. You know, but they do start in the beginning of like, um, checking on you really intensely and, and really heavily. And I do remember, you know, my sister, she did leave a daughter behind my niece, my surviving niece. And, um, there was actually one time where she came to me out of frustration and frustrated with me and my niece because I hadn't learned how to hone my, I guess my skills yet. And so when I was talking to her through mediumship or channeling as a medium, I didn't yet have the ability to do it by will and she had to kick it in. And so she was really harsh with me in terms of how she would let me know that she was there next to me. And one thing that she would do is when she was alive, she would like scare me sometimes. Like I'd be walking down the hallway and she would pop out of a corner and go boo. Um, sometimes she'd run up to me and she'd like punch me on the arm because she was an older sister. 
And so when she was dead, she would do the same shit. I would be walking and then she'd pop out like, boo, bitch, right? And, <laughs> and then I'd be ah, you know? Or she would hit me. There was times where I've woken up in the middle of the night rubbing my arm because the bitch hit me, right? And I could feel it. And that was her only way to like really like, hey, I'm here and I need you to take, I need you to, you know, listen to me. And so, you know, there was this one time with my niece where um, she she came and she was like, look, I'm trying to be there for her, my daughter. She's not listening. She doesn't know that I'm there. She can't sleep at night. And I'm trying to tell her I'm there, but she can't hear me. I need you to call her and tell her I'm there. So I did that. And then I heard from my niece the following morning and she was like, you know, it's so weird. I felt like I could go to sleep last night finally because I felt my mother's presence. And I was like, oh, really? I figured you would. And when I went and pick up that way, my sister would then come into my dreams, which is another way of channeling. Remember, that's a trance state when I would be sort of in the in-between. And she would talk to me there. And I'll never forget, she came into one of my dreams. And um, I have this thing where I know when spirit is talking to me, if I'm dreaming and it's normal, and then it, the dream stops. When the dream goes into like a freeze frame, everything is paused. But then someone is talking to me. Someone is walking towards me in the dream, but everything is paused. I know that it's an actual spirit and it's an actual message and I need to be paying attention. And so, and then I become lucid at that point. And so, um, but that's something that actually started with my sister. And so I will never forget, I was dreaming. And for whatever reason in this dream, I was told to go into an elevator and I went into the elevator and there was a bunch of people in there. And then there was a freeze frame moment. And I turned around in the elevator. And when I turned around, my sister was standing behind me smirking. Like, I had to do all of that to get your attention. And I said to her, well, what do you want? What's wrong? What's going on? She said, nothing. I just I just want to say hi. I can't check on you. I can't check on my sister. And I was like, oh, hi. And so, um, but it was through her and like all of those experiences. She's the reason why I, I started seeing shadows because she was just absolutely relentless and different spirits and being able to see different energies. She's the reason why I'm clear audience because she kept yelling at me in my ears until it, and so it opened me up to a point where I can now hear as well. And, um, but that's where it started. It wasn't my choice. It was also heavily triggering. That was also an experience where I learned that um, spirits actually leave the body and I was actually able to like experience what that felt like. And the reason for that was because it was such an unfortunate situation. I actually was the one that actually went and identified her body in the morgue. And I remember going into the morgue being absolutely terrified because of what you hear about morgues and the idea that they're supposed to be creepy or scary. And there's like this weird thing about maybe there's a lot of spirits in morgues. And when I went in there, I was really shocked at just how empty a morgue felt. And there are bodies everywhere. I remember walking in there and there was bodies and white blankets and every, every toe had a tag on it. And, um, but I don't remember feeling like spirit. I remember it being eerie because you're looking at dead bodies, but like the spirit aspect of it wasn't there. And I remember when I had walked up to what they presumed was her body that I had to identify and they pulled the white sheet over, pulled the white sheet down so I could see her face. I remember having this really profound, like spiritual moment where I was like, okay, that's her body, but that's not her. Like, that's what she looked like, but that's not her. And because what I could sense was the emptiness of the body. I could sense immediately that nothing was in it. And it was at that moment where I realized that her essence, her presence, her effervescence, her personality, everything that she was, was never the body. It was the spirit that was residing inside of the body. And when the body died, she hopped out of her, her body. And I knew she was out of her body because me and her had been working together the whole time. So I knew where, exactly where she was. It wasn't the feeling of, oh my God, my sister is lost. I knew where she was. I was just very vividly, heavily aware that she wasn't in the body. And that was how I learned like, oh, spirits don't actually stay there. That's also a lot of the times like anyone that has been to a funeral uh, that maybe was like open casket. When you go to look at the body, there's something that's just not quite right about it. The person looks like themselves, but like they don't. Their face is their face, but it's not. There's something that's missing. And what it is, is the animation that the spirit is actually creating, right? It's not the body itself. It's the spirit. 
But that was my journey into it. It was, you know, it was incredibly traumatic and um, uh, really incredibly scary. There's nothing worse to be grieving. And then now you can see shadows. And then so, you know, that led to an entire mental health journey that took years that led to um, like a four or five year period of never sleeping. I never slept at night during that time because too many things were happening. I could hear things. I could see things. I didn't I didn't have word vocabulary words for what was happening to me. And every time I tried to say to someone that something was wrong, no one believed me. They just wrote it off as extreme grief. And so I was really struggling with that whole journey by myself of coming into what my skills are alone because I felt like nobody, I didn't know how to tell you somebody that this was what was happening. I went to every psychiatrist that you can think of. I was on all the medicine and the dopes that you can think of because I didn't know what to do. And I'll never forget going to a counselor explaining what I was going through. And she tried to rec um, insinuate that I was schizophrenic. And that was when I was like, this is no longer the path for me. I don't know what that path is, but this like modern medicine, I know I'm not like ill, but I don't have the vocabulary words to describe what's happening. And I think that that is speeds so much into like why I teach the way that I teach and why I explain things the way I explain things because of understanding the frustration of going through this, but not having the vocabulary words to explain what you're going through, but also not having anyone around you that can help you control it. Because when you are going through this and you don't know what's happening and you don't know how to control it, it can be incredibly scary. What I know now is that it's nothing to be afraid of. But when you are dealing with society and you're dealing with the church and you're dealing with um, uh, just what people tell you ab about this world and how it's evil and, and don't bring in something you 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 bring that those ideologies with you when you walk into this space and when you don't have somebody to help you it can be incredibly daunting and so that's a lot of the reason as to why I do what I do because I recognize that I wish that I had someone like me to teach me someone who was like regular and someone who did regular things and lived a regular life and had a regular job I remember wishing that they were just regular because when I would come across people, they would have the sort of spiritual aesthetic, the wispy hair and the long flowy skirts, and they would sing in this sing song voice. And that's not me. That's not who I am. And I couldn't relate to it. I was like, okay, you are the picture of the thing that society says I'm not supposed to mess with, but I'm supposed to listen to you and you're supposed to teach me and I'm supposed to trust that. I can't trust that. And so, you know, that put me on a quest and eventually I ended up with a psychic because I didn't know where else to go. And I went to a psychic one day, her name was Julie, I'll never forget. She changed the entire course of my life because she was the first person that gave me the answer to what I was doing. Or she was the first, first person that tried. And when I told her what I was experiencing in a very nonchalant way, she said, oh honey, you're just a little medium mystic. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And so now here I am, trying really hard to explain to you all what things mean because I understand the impact that that can have on someone's life. I understand how empowered you can feel walking away from knowing that you are the one that's actually in charge of everything that's actually going around you. So um, I actually did not mean to go off on that tangent. That was a left when I was actually meaning to go right. But I feel like the fact that it came out I probably one was supposed to share it because it's actually a story that I, I don't ever tell ever. I've, I've buried it for a long time because it's sad. But I also suspect that there are probably a number of you that could that probably needed to hear it. So much of our journeys at the moment are overlapping. And I always say like energy attracts like energy. And you guys share your stories with me. There's so many things that I read in your stories that I relate to. And so I want to do the same thing back. And maybe there's something that you can relate to. And if you can't relate to the story, maybe you understand, you know, why I'm on the Internet doing whatever it is that I'm doing. Right. 
Um, but anyway, I have rambled enough. I'm going to end the video here. If you guys do have any other questions, though, that you would like me to answer or attempt to explain to you in terms of what's happening to you, what you're actually experiencing, or even when it comes to how to cope with certain things, how to cope with certain changes that you may be experiencing, put it in the comments. I read all the comments and I'm answering all of the questions in the order in which I'm getting them. And I'd be more than happy to answer it in a video because your question may be a question that somebody else has. And I may be able to help more of you. And you sharing what you want to know may help more of us, right? So as always, if you like what you see, subscribe to this channel. And I'll see you soon.